Watch for an all-new Quantum Leap two weeks from tonight. Now stay tuned for a Spy Magazine special, only on NBC. Jerry Seinfeld. I'm sort of famous. If I weren't, you probably wouldn't be watching me right now. It's that simple. Or is it? To normal, non-famous people, civilians, the world of fame may appear to be a seamless, super glamorous kaleidoscope of magazine covers, movie premieres, parties, having sex in airplanes, and of course, punching out photographers. But when you stop and take a closer look, as we will tonight here at the offices of Spy Magazine, fame turns out to be a very complex affair. Beginning today. Take the, the president of the United States. Of He's story. very famous. Billy Joel is famous too, but there's a difference. George Bush gets to lead the Western world, while Nancy Billy Joel gets to have children with a beautiful fashion model. Which is the better fame? Let's examine the evidence. Billy Joel has never, thank God, run for political office. George Bush, however, is allowed to strap on a guitar and rock out in his own special way in front of hundreds of screaming young Republicans. After years of intensive research and experimentation, Spy Magazine has learned a lot about fame. The discipline is called celebrity science. And while it won't necessarily save the world, it certainly helps explain the confusing often embarrassing times we live in. Tonight, we're gonna to reveal the rules that real life celebrities follow in order to become famous and to stay famous. You'll see actual shocking footage of famous people caught in the act of being famous. Plus, we'll have special reports from our science correspondent, Victoria Jackson, in the celebrity lab. Thanks, Jerry. Tonight, you'll witness actual scientific experiments involving real celebrities super glamorous celebrities like Ricardo Montalban and the Smothers Brothers. I'd watch that. We'll also hear the results of a nationwide celebrity poll from poll correspondent Harry Shearer. The Spy Celebrity Poll. It's a real, rigorously conducted survey of America's attitudes about famous people. For instance, who are America's least favorite celebrities? We'll find out tonight. Thank you, Harry. Just about everything you will see tonight is real. Tough, hard-hitting video journalism about a fascinating, glamorous, and ultimately inconsequential subject, famous people. So let's get right to it. America, as you may know, is a big country with room for many different kinds of celebrities. America is so big, you can be famous in one part of the country and be completely unknown somewhere else. It seems that nearly every resident of New York City is a fan of spoofy, raucous nightclub singer Buster Poindexter. I like Buster because he's a chameleon, because he can, he, can, he can be so many different things. Because he looks like Mac the Knife. He gives you a little of this, he gives you a little of this. Forget about it, what a show. But meanwhile, 2,000 miles away... Who the hell is Buster Poindexter? So who is famous in Las Vegas? Apparently, it's good-looking country music entertainer of the year, George Strait. I like George Strait because he is so good-looking. I tell you, it just doesn't get much better than that. Well, the lyrics of the song kind of hits home. Sometimes in the world of fame, it's not as much who you are, but where you are. Why do I like George Strait? But you're coming at me from the left wing. I, I don't know George Strait. But no matter where you are, the famous are different than you and me. Or different than you, anyway. Why, for instance, are celebrities so shockingly tan compared to normal people? Lonnie Anderson, tan. 
Elizabeth Taylor, Tanner. Dick Van Patten, Tanner still. George Hamilton, tannest of all. Andy Warhol. Hmm. Another celebrity mystery. Why do celebrities make no effort to be well behaved when cameras are around? <laughs> we don't like to do those kind of jokes. Is it hot in here or is it just me? They were in play and why do tonight. famous people speak in an entirely different language than the rest of America? Full of uh, excitement and enthusiasm uh, and, and uh, about the work of acting and what it might and what it was like to work on a part and, and uh, investigating a, a part and uh, finding how I could marry myself with the character and uh, just working in a lot, lot like working on a part. What is it about celebrityhood that lures some Americans into patterning their lives after those of famous people. Take this man. He told us he gets personal satisfaction from his alleged resemblance to a certain celebrity. Which one? That's right, Robin Williams. Three ordinary women. One mutual desire. To be just like Cher. I've gotten a taste of what it's like to be a superstar, and I think it's very difficult, more difficult than people realize. People following me down the street, they come asking for my autograph, and they, I say, well, I'm not really sure. They said, yes, you are, yes, you are. Like at one party, someone wanted, um, that's a moray. So, when the moon hits your eye, like a big piece of pie, that's a moray. So. Uh, project vote, what is that special fame getting something? Call it the X Factor that separates Meryl Streep and, say, Hervé Villachez from you and your next-door neighbors. We decided to take a closer look at this mysterious celebrity X Factor. Can it be isolated like a virus? How does it work on normal people, and what does it make them do? Let's go to Victoria at the Celebrity Laboratory and get some answers scientifically. Jerry, the experiment you're about to see was designed to examine the behavior of normal people suddenly and unexpectedly put in close proximity with a real live celebrity. In this case, the legendary Ricardo Montalban. First, Spy created a completely neutral environment, a windowless white room without any distractions, such as chairs or benches. Then we placed a surveillance camera overhead to provide video coverage of the entire room. Naturally, we took great care to conceal the camera so that the civilian's behavior would be completely spontaneous. With the environment prepared and the camera in position, a technician explained the experiment. Ricardo Montalban was told that his only duty in the experiment was to enter the room and stand in a specially marked box. The prime directive is to stay in that box no matter what happens. Be filled with about 20 to 30. Mr. Montalban was led through a dry run and shown his spot. Right up there. Oh yes. They can't see it. That'll shoot down and cover the whole room. All right. And right here is your. Your spot. That's my spot, all right? That's your box. You feel rather right important here. Yeah, well, you should. The test subjects arrived. These 26 normal people were recruited from a theme park tour and told only that they were going to the taping of a television show. They had no idea that they were about to be put in close proximity with Ricardo Montalban. We told them that they had to wait in a holding room before they could go in and watch the TV show. The experiment commenced. All right, Mr. Montalban, are you ready? I am ready. Okay, proceed right out into the room. We're speeding up this footage in order to better observe the celebrity-induced migration patterns. Look, there's Ricardo Montalban entering and going to his box. See how the normal people Everyone instantly else? recognize him as a celebrity. Spontaneously, they form a tight semicircle. What are you, what are you doing Note, however, that they refrain from making physical yes, contact while Mr. Montalban regales them with a light anecdote about the making of Fantasy Island. In order to test the celebrity's command of the environment, we now introduce a control element. Free coffee and donuts on the opposite side of the room. Yum. <laughs> yes, ma'am. 
Note how the oh, tight yes. semicircle breaks down as yeah, some people down. choose to satisfy their basic needs you know, for nourishment, even though it means sacrificing their proximity to an actual celebrity. But, um, what are you doing? However, most people who leave to get food well, then return to watch. Is, uh, uh, yeah, this basic human behavior may be responsible for the success of and concession no stands in movies. One gets food and then eats it while looking at a famous person. Finally, after eight minutes, the technician leads Mr. Montalban out of the room. Well, you've been very charming. Normal people be... drift about aimlessly. One normal person darts into Montalban's box, a truly stunning display of hubris. But the rest of the people, still in awe, stay away, realizing that in some sense, Montalban's box is sacred ground. There you have it, the celebrity X Factor in action. Final analysis, famous people definitely hold an unusual fascination for normal people. But then, so do glazed donuts. Jerry? Fascinating. We'll have more celebrity science experiments coming up, so if you want to learn how to be famous, as famous as Ricardo Montalban, I strongly suggest you don't go away. Did you know that some 10 million Americans would sacrifice a limb just to win an Oscar? In order to more precisely understand how fame works, Spy commissioned a survey of randomly selected Americans. We asked them about their attitudes towards celebrity. Here's Spy Magazine contributing editor Harry Shearer with the Spy Celebrity Poll. Harry? Thanks, Jerry. To conduct the poll, Spy turned to the respected New York polling firm of Penn and Schoen. Now, this is a firm whose clients include such luminaries as Senator Edward Kennedy, New York Mayor David Dinkins, corporate clients like Procter & Gamble. Doug Schoen is president of Penn and & Schoen, and he's with us today to explain a little bit about the Spy Celebrity Poll, the completely authentic Spy Celebrity Poll. Doug, tell us a little bit about it. Well, Harry, we interviewed a truly representative sample of 450 Americans. And we then weighted our data so that the people we interview reflected the demographics of the country as a whole. You know, one thing people always wonder, though, is how can 450 people represent a country of 250 million? Well, it's all in the way you pick your sample. We give every American a theoretically equal chance of being interviewed. And by doing that, the people we interviewed are actually representative of the population as a whole. Thanks, Doug. Let's get right to the poll. Who are America's favorite celebrities? Well, the top three, according to the spy poll, are Mel Gibson, Tom Selleck, and Bob Hope, in that order. All right, fine, but who are America's least favorite celebrities? The top three in order are Woody Allen, Jane Fonda, and Pee Wee Herman. Well, what does this mean? Let's take a closer, more intimate look. Madonna is America's 10th most disliked celebrity, tied with Roseanne Barr. But 35% of the men said that they would have sex with Madonna if she asked them to. According to our tabulations, by the way, the region in which the fewest number of men want to sleep with Madonna was the West Coast. Coincidentally, the region where Madonna lives. Now, Tom Cruise, on the other hand, is one of America's favorite celebrities, number 13, in fact. But only 17% of American women would have sex with Tom Cruise if he asked them. Okay, from this data, it seems possible to infer that American men are generally more likely than American women to sleep with people they don't like. Jerry? Fascinating. But sex always is. What we're trying to understand here is how exactly does one become a celebrity? Are there actual rules that all celebrities must obey? Yes. How many? Six. What are they? Rule number one. Have talent. <laughs> Talent is the ability to do something interesting and to do it so well that millions of people will pay money to watch you do it even if you've been doing it for 25 years or for nearly 400. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. And yet every year hundreds of people with no real ability of any kind become famous too by doing the same thing over and over and over just like talented people. The thing to remember is, you can have all the talent in the world, but talent alone won't get you to Carnegie Hall. 
that's rule number one. Have talent. If you're not talented, don't worry. Rule number one is the least important rule. Thanks to rule number two. Have handlers. Handlers, also called assistants or hangers-on, are the people who help celebrities become famous. A handler can be anyone, from an agent to a bodyguard to a psychotherapist, and sometimes all three. Typically, handlers travel in packs or entourages. Here comes Don Johnson with his entourage and the handler whose job it is to block the camera. Let's watch Eddie Murphy's handlers in action. First, the Eddie Murphy decoy gets out of the car and backs into the camera to protect Eddie from possible media overexposure. Some spare handlers get out of the car, and finally, here's Eddie. Another handler solicits directional advice and steers Eddie on the optimum celebrity trajectory. Here's Eddie with his entourage at work again. Just look at those handlers slide Eddie right through the crowd. Those guys really know how to entourage. Let's take a closer inside look. To help us do that is Joe Namath. Joe, can you explain the nuances of this entourage activity? Sure, Jerry, but first of all, I have to say I don't have an Eddie Murphy entourage playbook with me, so I'm going to have to kind of wing it. But here's how it analyzes each person's role. Uh, let's roll that tape, please. First, here's the path they're going to follow. Now, notice how the entourage is led by actress Jasmine Guy, uh, right here. Uh huh. Now, this is a shrewd gambit to clear the path through the crowd. No one's going to strong arm a beautiful and somewhat famous woman. Now, you see that? I see. Now, watch how the rest of the entourage follows right behind. Now, this handler right here, his job is to keep Eddie moving. Hmm. Now, what's going to stop Eddie? This is my favorite part. Now, watch this very carefully, Jerry. You see, now here's a slightly less popular comedian, a Chevy Chase, here, right here. See how Chevy reaches out to touch Eddie? Yeah. He wants Eddie to stop and talk. Now, Eddie doesn't want to seem like a jerk, so he has one of his own handlers move him along and slide in to cut Chevy off before he becomes a real nuisance. That's something. Can we look at that one more time? Yeah, you see? See, right there. Uh -huh. Then this handler on the other side puts a similar preemptory block on an interviewer. And this guy back here, he carries Eddie's personal effects. Oh, look at him go. The best in the business. Fascinating. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome, Jay. You know why most normal people don't become celebrities? It's because most normal people look normal. Celebrities need a distinctive, unusual look. Think of Telly Savalas, for instance, and you think, oh, yeah, the bald guy. Think of David Brenner, if you think of David Brenner at all, and you think, sure, the guy with the nose and lots and lots of teeth. Think Dolly Parton, and you think, enormous breasts. Here's actress Karen Allen, a fine, upstanding celebrity, but not a super, mega, fabulous celebrity like Telly or Dolly. The reason? Karen's look is almost exactly the same as actress Brooke Adams. On the other hand, actress Betty Davis in her later years wore an uncanny resemblance to one of the talking apple trees from The Wizard of Oz. And here's Mick Jagger, one of the most famous faces in rock and roll. A face that is chillingly similar to that of actor Don Knotts. Fortunately, Jagger and Knotts work in different fields. Jagger in rock and roll, Knotts in dinner theater. What does this teach us? That to be a celebrity, a bigger celebrity than Karen Allen, you need to have a unique look. It's a rule. In fact, rule number three, have a look. The best look, of course, is good looks. And today's mega celebrities are better looking and from many more angles than ever before. But it wasn't always this way. Back in the 1950s, chain smoking and conspicuous boozing were considered an important part of a celebrity's overall beauty profile. But those days are gone. Today's modern celebrities need to look healthy. Not necessarily be healthy, but look healthy. And talk healthy. I have been off drugs, liquor, and uh, cigarettes since 1969, and that's a very important part of my health regime. Some celebrities have learned that unwholesome habits, along with the natural wear and tear of celebrity life, can wreak havoc on a celebrity's carefully crafted look. Fortunately, modern science provides remedies. A snip here, a lop there, a tuck, a stretch, a bit of fat vacuuming for good measure. And voila! Perfectly good-looking celebrities become even more perfectly good-looking. 
older celebrities regain youthfulish complexions. And the ethnic stars of the 70s can easily adapt to the new traditionalist beauty ideals of the 80s, 90s, and beyond. More than talent, more than handlers, a distinctive look is a celebrity's most important asset. Because, just think about this for a minute. If celebrities didn't look like celebrities, it would be impossible to tell them apart from non-celebrities. And that would lead to anarchy. We'll be right back. Life as a famous person certainly is different from life as a statistically average American. Or, at least that's what statistically average Americans think. For more on that, let's return to Harry Shearer. What is the day-to-day -day existence of a common celebrity like? Well, we could have asked some common celebrities to give us straight answers, but we're not entertainment tonight. Instead, we asked you, the American public, to sound off on a subject that you may or may not know anything about. Do celebrities have more sex than normal people? Well, 26% of Americans said yes, 61% said no. Now, this doesn't mean that celebrities have less sex than normal people. Maybe they just do it more surreptitiously. We asked, do all celebrities live in giant houses and eat fish eggs? 32% of Americans agreed, 61% disagreed, 7% said they didn't know enough about either celebrities, giant houses, or fish eggs to hazard a guess. We probed further on the question of celebrity leisure pursuits. We asked America to respond to the following statement. Nearly every celebrity has been to the Playboy Mansion. Now, while the vast majority of Americans found this a dubious proposition, a full 19%, roughly 50 million people, believe that, yes, nearly every single celebrity has hung out at Heff's place. And finally, what about theology? We asked America, are celebrities a force for divine good in the world? An alarmingly high 24% of respondents believe this to be so. And true enough, Jesus, Buddha, and Mohammed could all be considered celebrities. But remember, so could James Woods. Jerry? Thanks, Harry. I don't know much about theology, but I do know a little bit about the Playboy Mansion. That is, I know I've never been there. Victoria, how about you? Well, Jerry, maybe you haven't been a celebrity long enough. I went there for about two years when I was just starting out and I was a starving actress. Johnny Crawford, the rifleman's son, he used to take me on his motorcycle up to the mansion and, well, thanks, Hef, for all the free food. Um, Jim Brown used to be there and Harry Reams and Carol Connors, the lady who wrote the words to the Rocky theme, you know, gonna fly now, flying high now. And, uh, Mm, I just used to eat a lot. Uh, I don't think Hef ever really learned my name because he always called me Sweetie. Wow, isn't that wild? Makes you kind of forget for a minute that celebrities have jobs to do just like everyone else. Normal people go to work in offices. Celebrities go to work on talk shows. Now, you and I both know there are unwritten codes that govern behavior at the office. Suck up to the boss. Don't smell bad. But most civilians are completely unaware of the complex etiquette that governs talk show appearances. Fortunately, a real-life talk show host has agreed to help us out with the following educational demonstration. Okay, Rick, I uh, have now for my next guest a lady whose face should be familiar. She's a regular on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Victoria Jackson. Right here. Thank you. Victoria, thank you for being here. I'd be very lonely without you here. Uh, you're really looking great. Thank you. You're looking great, too, Dick. <laughs> First of all, wear something revealing to get the audience's attention. But pretend like you're modest by pulling it down and rearranging it. Of course, if you really were modest, you wouldn't wear a dress like this. Now, I uh, hope this isn't too personal, but they tell me you're a mommy now. Oh, right? yeah. Um... It's not personal. I love being a mother. My daughter is one month old, and her name's Kazumel, and she's so adorable and wonderful, and she's so smart. She's only one month old, and she can already go like this. 
<laughs> Don't be afraid to be dull. Details about your personal life that would bore friends in real conversation are just fine on a talk show. You uh, named your daughter Cozumel, is it? Intentionally, I, I suppose. Now, my husband and I were in Mexico on a vacation, and um, I don't know how to say this. And um, ten months ago. <laughs> It's always good to work in at least one humorous anecdote, even if you have to make it up. In real life, my daughter's name is Scarlett, but it's too boring to say, I love the movie Gone with the Wind, because every woman loves the movie Gone with the Wind, so I made up the Cozumel thing. You see, someone from the talk show staff calls you ahead of time and pre-interviews you and writes it on this card, and then the host asks you questions as if they just occurred to him. Um... You, uh, oh, uh, they tell me that uh, you um, <clears throat> uh, have a, a clip from your special. I didn't know they sent a clip. <laughs> well, I, I guess we should just roll it. And it'll explain itself, I hope. Okay. <laughs> okay. Always be surprised when the talk show host mentions your clip. Of course, the only reason you're on the show is to promote your project, but the audience likes to think that you just stopped by to chat. No time. Okay, well, it's a problem we always have at this. Well, we'll look at the clip after this. Anyway... Well, I taught you how to behave on a talk show. Don't go away. I'll be back. <laughs> for celebrity success. One of the most important being rule number four, stay contemporary. In other words, keep up with the times. Famous people ignore this rule at their peril. And most work very, very hard at staying contemporary. Meet the most beautiful creature. Here's Shane Fonda striking future. a cheesecake pose in the mid-60s. Heyday of swingers, Swedish stewardesses, and Playboy magazine. Barbarella. And she makes science fiction something else. Jane Fonda is Barbarella. But suddenly it's 1972, and Jane fits right in with a tougher, more radically chic anti-war look. Whose specialty is... Love. Then, a decade later, it's time for more cheesecake. 80s style, that is, as Jane and a nation of lonely, narcissistic young professionals get back in shape. Then there's Cher. Somehow, she metamorphosized from a hippy-dippy singer with a sad sack boyfriend to the huge Oscar-winning star we know today. It felt really, really good about being able to achieve something that seemed so impossible. There are, however, easier ways of staying contemporary. Take Bob Hope. No one's ever accused him of pandering to changing times. But watch closely as he rings up-to-the-minute variations out of a single setup. In this case, a pretty girl and a suggestive comment. I just want you boys to see what you're fighting for, that's all. <laughs> well, I'm 20 years old, 5 feet 7, and I weigh 8 stone. 8 stone? Man, yes. that's what I call a rock festival. <laughs> Any of you guys have a pair of high heels I can borrow? For male celebrities, one of the simplest ways to stay contemporary is to change hairstyles every few years. And for those lucky few unencumbered by a thick head of hair, the toupee, or a whole army of toupees, can create a really distinctive look or variety of looks. Looks that will keep on working well into the 21st century. Here, we're running an animated simulation of an aerodynamic hairpiece prototype that we've designed for Burt Reynolds. Burt's toupee is often subjected to adverse conditions. The car chase and Smokey and the Bandit. The car chase and Hooper. The car chase and Smokey and the Bandit Part 2. Here, we're testing how his toupee might stand up under a small craft wind advisory. 
a lot of thought goes into convincing people that Bert's toupee is actually real hair. While being an ultra-contemporary celebrity isn't always easy, figuring out what's contemporary is. Just watch what other celebrities are doing. And what are all the other celebrities doing in 1990? They're being smart, or failing that, looking smart. That's rule number five. Seem intelligent. Not long ago, brainy celebrities had to hide their intelligence, acting silly in order to pass as the kind of simple-minded, fun-loving star the public craved. Today, braininess is in for smart and less smart people alike. And while you can't necessarily buy intelligence, you can buy a pair of eyeglasses. Another shortcut to seeming smart is supporting a cause. Now, it's important to support worthy causes, but every few years, there's a new extra special worthy cause that seems to attract celebrities. This is the rainforest in 1900. And this is the rainforest today. And this is the rainforest in 30 years in present. The tropical continue. forests produce oxygen for the world. You know, air, you need it to breathe. I Why do we heed Madonna's ecological advice? Is she secretly an expert on atmospheric warming trends? No, but she is a really good dancer. Every day, so much of the jungle is destroyed. I don't, I'm not sure of the numbers, but it's, it's astonishing. So why do we listen to Christy Brinkley's charming and insightful observations? Probably because she's so pretty and because she's still married to Billy Joel. Of course, the more pertinent question is why do we think Sting and Madonna and Christy Brinkley are intelligent? because lately they've been talking about serious complex issues, like saving the rainforest. But do normal Americans really care whether their intelligent seeming celebrities are in fact intelligent? Harry? Well, Jerry, the spy poll did ask normal Americans which hobbies we would prefer our celebrities to have. The top three pastimes are gourmet cooking, watching sports, and driving race cars. Yeah. Now, does even one of these popular hobbies require any special intellectual skills? I don't think so. And in fact, hobbies that do demand some hint of mental effort scored much lower. Reading books, as a matter of fact, ended up very near the bottom of our scale, much less popular than hunting. Writing poetry did get 3% of the vote, but it was less popular than both partying in Aspen and surfing. And America's least respected celebrity hobby? Alas. Only 1% of our respondents felt that famous people should be Civil War buffs. That's sad news indeed for baseball great Keith Hernandez, a former New York Met, and yes, the only celebrity Civil War buff we could think of. Jerry? Well, now you know enough rules to become famous, or at least sort of famous, like me. Now, many of you probably taped this show and are watching it on your VCR. If you are, stop the tape when I say so and follow the first five rules. Ready? Stop the tape. OK. So now, in theory, you're at least as famous as me. It's easy living from here on, right? Not exactly. If you want to become a super mega celebrity, you've got some hard work ahead. You see, when you're famous, you're duty bound to spread yourself around. It's a rule. In fact, rule number six. Be your best celebrity self. This is probably the hardest rule for a non-celebrity to understand. And yet, to most celebrities, it just comes naturally. For instance, it could mean marketing your very own brand of perfume. I don't think it makes any sense at all for a, nor uh, for a celebrity to be involved in a, you know, a fragrance, just to attach their name. I mean, I, I'm involved from every, every move. Yeah. I've been involved from the scratch, developing the scent and... Uh, it also means figuring out something to say about your perfume. It's, you know, if you like it, it's great. It's a woozy. It's a, it's a, a less floral. Uh, it's uh, to do with my passion for men. Uh, sort of a foresty a bark, uh, a bit... Uh... Listen, 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 the fragrance you can hear, the fragrance you can hear. Man, that's great. It's, it's, it's a very uh, complex fragrance, I would say. Being your best celebrity self means cutting an album, doing a music video, especially if you're not really a singer.
Now that you're famous, the public has seen enough of your talent. Now they want to see your hobbies. That's right, being your best celebrity self means doing things nobody would ever let you do if you weren't already famous. But I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And there's one special hobby that literally all Hollywood stars, every single one of them would love to share, being a filmmaker. And maybe go into producing or something like that. To me, I'm happy if it's creative. I don't have to be an actor, I can be behind the camera. You know, I come to your studio and I look at your camera, video camera, and I go crazy because I like to be... Hervé Villachez, the Vim vendors of the 1990s? Aren't there limits? What if Arnold Schwarzenegger decides to write and publish his own poetry? What if Stephen King gets a cabinet post? What if, well, Spy wondered, what if Donald Trump were to get his own Saturday morning cartoon show? Trump, Trump, Trump. Donald Trump. We'll be right back. We've seen how to become famous. We've seen how great it is to be famous. But there is a darker side to fame. Victoria Jackson is in the spy celebrity lab. All celebrities are not created equal, as this actual experiment was designed to prove. Hi, I have Sylvester Stallone on the phone for Phil Donahue. Is he available? Sylvester Stallone, yes, that's right. Thank you. She didn't really have Stallone on the line. It was an experiment to see how quickly celebrities, in this case Phil Donahue, who we actually called, will call back other celebrities. Yes, hi. Phil Donahue, please. I have Joey Bishop on the line for him. Okay, well, could you have him call Mr. Bishop back? Yeah, that's uh, 212... <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. In the world of celebrity, one's hotness is measured by how quickly people call you back. Hotness is showbiz slang for inherent work. 8711. Yes, Mr. Donahue, this is not Sylvester Stallone's office, but thank you very much for participating in a spy celebrity experiment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Unfortunately, we can't show you this experiment in its entirety because after 14 hours and 32 minutes, we finally let our camera crew go home. But just to make sure that our camera results weren't caused by some secret feud, Spy also did this experiment with some other people. These are actual results of actual crank calls made to celebrities. Steven Spielberg returned Stallone's call in 3 hours, 29 minutes, and 12 seconds. It took Spielberg 12 days, 19 hours, and counting to return Joey Bishop's call. Geraldo Rivera callback time to Stallone, 3 hours, 16 seconds. To Bishop, 14 days, 22 hours, and counting. But here's something that will raise an eyebrow. Diane Sawyer took both calls right away, keeping Stallone and Bishop waiting for only 33 and 35 seconds, respectively. Diane Sawyer is a TV newswoman. So as you've seen, celebrity hotness is a relative proposition. Fascinating. 20 years ago, these results would have been completely different. Back then, Sylvester Stallone was a nobody. Joey Bishop, on the other hand, was the big star of a network TV talk show. What happened to Joey between then and now? Some call it Tony Orlando and Dawn Syndrome. Our more precise scientific term is celebrity recognition fall-off factor. Either way, experts still don't fully understand this tragic phenomenon. We only know that it happens, and that no famous person is immune. And now you too can feel what it's like to experience this horrible affliction. Here at SPY, we've perfected a system whereby you, the viewer, 
can feel all the sensations of being a pathetic has-been without ever leaving your home. Get close to your TV. Closer. Right up to the screen. Or just sit where you are. That's fine, too. But prepare for the ride of your life. In Spy's Home Viewer Celebrity Simulator. It's a simulation, yes. But for the next minute and a half, you are the celebrity. Or rather, former celebrity. The following material may be too intense for the easily depressed. Listen, now just one second. Shh, 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 shh. Okay. I spoke to the network, and they are just not interested in a reunion special. Frankly, I can see their position. I mean, uh, your series lasted, what, uh, five episodes? Come on. That's a no-can do. Well, what can I say? Uh, you're going to land on your feet. You're bigger than this. You're, uh... You're bigger than this. I don't care if you were on a TV show. I'm not paying for some Johnny Carson. I'm paying for a clown. And you, my friend, are going to wear this nose. There. You look great. Hello, everybody. Have I got a treat for you? Friends, there's someone I'd like you to meet. This is Nutty Joko, the price-slashing clown. <laughs> not pretty, is it? Indeed, the only good thing about being a celebrity past your prime is that you're in good company. Let's go to poll correspondent Harry Shearer and the spy poll for some insights into celebrity recognition fall-off factor. Harry? Thanks, Jerry. Marie Osmond. Is she alive or dead? We thought that asking this question would be a surefire way to find out if America has been paying close attention to her career. And almost everybody we polled, 94% knew that Marie Osmond is, in fact, still living. Not only that, a whopping 96% of white people, more than any other ethnic group, were aware of Marie Osmond's continuing organic viability. Now, that's an intriguing statistic indeed, and heartening, but, but what about Red Skelton? He, too, is alive. And yet a remarkable 41% of Americans think that he's dead. This may seem like a cruel fate for a man who has entertained so many for so long, but in fact, Red Skelton's fate is not the worst a celebrity can suffer. 44% of Americans know that Drew Barrymore is alive. 30% think she's dead. That's sad. But not as sad as this. 25%, one quarter of the entire population of this country, doesn't know either way. Jerry. Fortunately, there are a number of possible cures for a faltering career. We call them comeback tactics. Making a workout video is a great way to regain attention, and best of all, it's like giving to charity. No matter how small your actual contribution, no one can say you're not doing something positive. Fitness walking is a perfect way to lose inches from your arms, buttocks, waist, abdomen, hips. Now that could be reason enough, but there's more. Through trial and error, celebrities have learned Taking off your clothes in front of the public really makes them pay attention and could just possibly jumpstart a floundering career. Well, let's start off with the basics. I have a good body. And they were very, very supportive and very nice about it. And most of the people that have been in Playboy have gotten some real nice movie deals and a lot of recognition and mostly respect. And I think that's one thing I really need in the industry and I'm looking for is some respect because I'm good. The word exhibitionism, I don't know what that means. I love to pose. But it, Playboy is really beautiful. It really is. We agreed on the fact that it would be very sophisticated, very artsy, and very elegant. It's not like a hustler. Of course, posing nude is just one embarrassing way to draw attention to yourself. There are other methods. Make a shocking, intensely personal confession. And while you're at it, you might as well pick up some extra cash. You probably need it at this point in your career by making that confession in a best-selling celebrity autobiography. For instance, here's David Crosby on his drug addiction. Here's Shelley Winters on her affairs with every man in Hollywood. Here's Michael Reagan and Maureen Reagan and Patty Davis on their horrible parents. But if all else fails, there is one sure ticket to celebrity, immortality. It's drastic and possibly irrevocable depending on your religious views, but it works. The odds are less than one in a million that a living Lucy would have been on even a single People magazine cover last year, unless she made two different shocking confessions. But she didn't. Instead, she died. And as a dead person, Lucille Ball was on the cover of People twice. 
plus newspaper front pages across the country. Or think of the posthumous careers of James Dean, Roy Orbison, Vincent Van Gogh, and Jim Croce. The conclusion is inescapable. Americans love the dead. Or at least Americans love dead celebrities. Far more than they love still living celebrities they've forgotten about. Survival of the unfit. Is this some sort of reverse celebrity Darwinism? Hmm. We'll be right back. program, we saw how the mysterious celebrity X Factor worked its magic on normal people. We saw complete strangers drawn to Ricardo Montalban like moths to a flame. But is that what being famous is all about? Could we induce the same reaction using artificial stimuli? Could we, as it were, synthesize the X Factor? Let's go one more time to Victoria Jackson. Thank you, Jerry. What you are about to see is possibly the most elaborate celebrity experiment ever devised. Using great. a specially rigged hidden camera, we put the Smothers Brothers, the world famous Smothers Brothers, on an ordinary New York street, Fifth Avenue, and monitored the event. Okay. We asked them to walk down the street to see exactly how much attention they would attract from ordinary pedestrians. After that, we asked a very big dog and a giant radish to follow the exact same route so we could see how much attention they would attract. Then we compared the footage side by side. There's one rec make that two recognitions for the Smothers Brothers. Back there by the curb, that's one for the dog and radish. Look, there's another for the Smothers, but we'll have to count that one as half a point since Tommy took the initiative and accosted the man. Meanwhile, the dog and radish are attracting a small crowd of curious pedestrians. Plus a poodle. They're really racking up the points. Look at those Smothers Brothers go. No one can say they're not good sports. Jerry? The final tally? In 30 seconds on the street, the big dog and the giant walking radish scored 13 certified recognitions, while the Smothers Brothers scored only five. So what would you say? Are big dogs and giant walking radishes the same thing in essence as celebrities? Or better. Should someone who wants to be famous go out and buy a giant walking radish suit? I'm afraid not. If it were that easy, the streets would be filled with big dogs and giant walking radishes and their agents. For Spy Magazine, goodbye. <laughs> Later tonight, Jay Leto hosts The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson with guest Crystal Bernard from the new NBC comedy Wings and actress Christine Lottie, plus the Huber marionettes. Hey, put that book down and watch The Tonight Show tonight. Then Dave welcomes Dudley Moore, L.A. Lakers coach Pat Riley and singer Graham Parker to Late Night with David Letterman. An hour of celebrities talking about themselves constantly interrupted by commercials. Hey, America, the pride is back. See them in court? Wouldn't you love that? Wouldn't you love it? I mean, uh, if I did that, I'd sell a lot of spy magazines. That's the only problem. We'll see. Thank Take care. You.